When you know what you want for the future, you need the present to line up with your goals. UCF Online offers more than 100 fully online programs in healthcare, engineering, criminal justice, and more. So you can get to your future and beyond. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I am Tom Cavanaugh. I'm Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Mm -hmm. Greetings, Kelvin. Greetings, Earthling Tom. <laughs> greetings, Earthling Tom. Whenever yeah. you say greetings, I, I kind of, I, I'm, I'm stuck in a 50s sci-fi movie and I think, you know, there's aliens among us. Yeah, take me to your leader. Mm -hmm. yeah. There it is. Yeah. I always, you know, I've actually thought about that. Going um, to like, somebody's like, leader? No, well, like if an alien showed up today out in the parking lot hmm. and they came out and said, mm -hmm. greetings, Earthling. Take me to your leader. And I'm like, okay, you want to meet the provost? I mean, like, <laughs> who, who, are, who would you take them to? There is no leader of Earth, this right? Is, this is fascinating insight into the mind of Tom. I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is, this is good. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, it's, I, you know, I guess it, the local municipality? I, I mean, guess, yeah. The state? The, the county mayor? Federal? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, governor? Where do you I go? Know. Yeah. The UN? I, I, you yeah. know, they don't have any real power, but you know, there's some symbology there. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd probably just bore them with these questions. Well, what do you really mean? And then they just get back in their spaceship and okay, fly we're away. Right. No, li no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fly bureaucrats. Away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just fly away. Eh, next, yeah, yeah, go ahead and put the free wave through. <laughs> See, now that's a that's a hitchhiker's cut. Yes, I did. I got that. That's a deep cut. Mm -hmm. I got that one. That's All right. right. Why well, we get off on these tangents? And I, I assure the, the the one listener we have still on this, uh -huh. um, we don't plan these. <laughs> it's it's you know. it's staggering that we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And people people are thinking. That's so carefully scripted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How clever. No. Actually, they don't. They don't think that at all. I wouldn't. Yeah. Well. I don't, know. and I'm mm. in it. Yeah. Oh no, we've we've blown the mystique of the entire thing. Shall we move on, Kelvin? <laughs> Shall Let's. we move on Let's. to this uh, lovely thermos I see across the table from uh -huh, us here, yeah. and and this lovely mug that I'm drinking out of, which mm -hmm. was um, filled up from your thermos. Yes. And I don't know what I'm drinking. It's coffee, Tom. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> that's right. That delicious brown liquid is coffee. And this particular coffee is a single origin Rwanda from right here locally at uh, Lineage Coffee Roasting, specifically right down the right down the street. We've got a Lineage location. And uh, it was wonderful. It was a little bit of serendipity. It was uh, roasted just a couple of days ago. I love it when I can get just a just a couple of days old roasting. Yeah. That was wonderful. Uh, I don't recall us. We've had Rwanda uh, coffee on here before. I don't recall us commenting on this, but uh, I will today that more than most coffee growing countries, Rwanda has benefited from development aid targeted at the coffee industry. Uh, this was following that you know, well-known horrible genocide in the, the 90s. And this puts me in mind of that metaphorical image that many of us may remember seeing in which individuals of differing heights are all maybe reaching up to grasp something or in some of them they're all trying to peek over the fence or whatever and uh, like if they're reaching up to grasp something maybe it's a like a fruit from a tree or something and there are usually two images juxtaposed and in the first one maybe only one person can achieve their goal but the next one you got this undergirding scaffolding that enables everyone to uh, achieve their goal of reaching the fruit or looking over the fence or 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 whatnot and um, you know it's sort of a an image of, of of equitable outcomes of sorts so anyway that puts me in mind of it from the the Rwanda bit of development aid you know but I'm glad that they got it because I'm glad that we got it and yeah and it's a tasty cup of coffee what do you think it is I uh, I like it very much it's good mm -hmm. thank you and uh, yeah um, and I think I see a connection there. Ooh, I like it when that happens. Yeah. So, um, you know, the whole idea of equity and um, being kind of aware of that with your development mm -hmm, aid, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, connection, mm -hmm. that, um, that we're going to talk a little bit, among other things, about uh, kind of equity-based, equity-informed instructional design. Mm-hmm. 
And that's right. you know, as much as we are interested in it, I, I think there are others more expert in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we talk to one of them today. That's right. Yeah, that's at least right. you do. Yeah, well, that's right. And by extension, you do. Oh, that's true. So shall I go ahead and... um, Please. Yeah. So Kelvin, Mm -hmm. you recently interviewed Katrina Ware, Mm -hmm. a senior learning experience designer with uh, Western Governors University, WGU Labs. Mm -hmm. Katrina was formerly an instructional designer at Penn State University and Mm -hmm. at Drexel Mm -hmm. University. She has also been quite active in the work of the Online Learning Consortium what we like to call OLC. Yep. Um, we appreciate her um, coming on TopCast. Is there anything you want to say about the interview before we take a listen? I think the interview works. I, I will plug one thing that we'll uh, put in the show notes as well that's a little time sensitive. At the time that this episode uh, is scheduled to release, uh, listeners can still, if they would like, join in to an online book discussion that Katrina is co-leading around the book Design Justice by author Dr. Sasha Costanza Chuck. So look for info on the group and the discussion in the show notes of the episode. I'm sure that uh, Katrina and the other organizers would be happy to have you. Cool. All right. Through the magic of podcast time travel, here is your interview with Katrina Ware. Hey, Katrina, so good to have you on TopCast today. Hi, thanks for having me too. I'm really excited about our conversation. Well, we've we've talked uh, off and on for a few months about some of your interest and in, in speaking around um, the kind of the intersections of equity and the work of instructional designers. And so I was hoping we might just sort of I don't know, pick a metaphor, peel that onion a little bit, and we can both be reduced to tears. No, no, maybe, maybe that's not, not a good yeah. metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pull that thread. We'll see. We'll see where we'll see where that line of conversation takes us. How about how about that? How did how did you end up getting fascinated with the intersection of uh, equity and instructional design? Yeah, I so I'm, I started my PhD at Penn State a couple of years ago, and um, during well, actually a little bit before COVID, but also carrying through. the the COVID era, I had some classes with one of the faculty members who was newly hired in our department, Dr. Tanner Vea, and a lot of his work was around um, social justice and online learning and and just like learning in general. And so, you know, his addition to the faculty and the the courses that that I took with him were really influential in changing the way I thought about my work as an instructional designer and really like the impact that people in our role can have for all the learners who interact with the content that we partner with others to create and put out there. Mm -hmm. No, it's very cool. Now, I know from hearing you a little bit talk about related topics that, and, you know, uh, my own uh, observations about kind of the role, the, you know, the role of instructional designer varies a little bit institutional, institutional context to institutional context, but I think sometimes we can run into this uh, thought that, well, instructional designers can only do so much, right? Uh, I wonder if we might just talk a little bit about kind of the kind of the how much, right? <laughs> you know, like what, how much influence does one have or could one have as an instructional designer? And then how does that, you know, like a, a, a trajectory like pursuing uh, equitable outcomes you know, how is that best pursued as an instructional designer, would you say? How's that? That's a lot of, that's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to, to pick that one up. So I think I've, what I've learned in my career is that every institution, instructional designers are kind of positioned a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And so I can speak from my own experience where I've always been really lucky to have a team around me. I've been embedded within a disciplinary college, like mm-hmm. um, business or the arts. Um, and so having that team and the support of, of my teammates and supervisors and that just those relationships, you know, we're already embedded where the faculty are. There's already this expectation that there is a relationship between the folks who are teaching residential and then working with us to do online learning. Um, that we're, we're there as supporters, we're there in some cases as experts on, you know, the design process for online learning. And I think the other thing that we tend to get looked 
looked to for advice on is like the student experience, you know, because mm-hmm. we've had the experience of working with people who've taught online and, and just like gleaning all those learnings from the different folks that we interact with. So I think that coming to the collaboration from a place of wanting to support instructors and support faculty and help them help the students learn. That's always been kind of my goal and what draws me to the field in the first place is helping learners have a better experience. And that also comes from a place of recognizing that like there's always room to improve, right? We're never perfect, we're never done. Um, And that's something in design that we always talk about um, and something that You know, you tend to get a little bit of like the the grin and bear it from an instructor, you know, after you've gone through the process of designing a course, it's like, oh, finally, this is over. And it's like, it's not actually over. There's always (laughs) next semester where we can improve. And so I guess if if, um, I were talking to a an instructional designer who's interested in in kind of pursuing this work and, and figuring out how they can make change in their own area of influence, I would start I would tell them to start there. I would say, like, you know, get your basics together first, develop that relationship with with your faculty member that you're working with, build that trust, and then introduce and say like, hey, we can really level this up. Or, you know, have you heard about, um, you know, some critical instructional design? Are you familiar with equitable design practice or liberatory design? Um, and, you know, if they, they're they open and receptive to that, um, you know, it's definitely a place to, to pursue on those individual levels. You could also um, work with your um, supervisors and other people on your team, hopefully if you have those resources to just get that support. And then if it's a departmental initiative, that's, you know, that's a wave that just carries everybody with it. So mm-hmm. those would be, I guess it's like a two prong approach. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's, that's, that's good. That's helpful. I wonder to what extent have you found it useful in particular to start with data versus starting with aspirations, right? Like you can, you can have aspirational outcomes in terms of, you know, equity, equitable outcomes, but you could also say, hmm, let's look at these institutional data. What do they say, right? And uh, which, which have, have you pursued both of those, either of those? What's your, what's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, whenever you can show data, I think that helps, especially in higher ed, right? I mean, data and research is like the currency of higher education and how we show, you know, power and influence through those, those um, you know, anecdotes you can collect, any numbers, of course, those always seem to sway opinions. But I think for me, and when I think about this kind of work, what what is really powerful is like story and and Mm -hmm. stories of learners and how they come to the classroom, whether it's on the ground or online, um, what, what their experience is like and kind of, you know, trying to figure out where do those comparisons exist or where are those stories and and really fleshing them out and, and bringing those experiences to the forefront and putting faces to, you know, some of the ideas that you're, you're trying to promote in your area of influence. Because I don't, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've read a lot, but I ha- can't say that I've read everything. Obviously, I don't know if anybody's read everything, but there's nothing that comes to mind immediately in terms of like a really traditional, like quantitative study on like equitable design in mm-hmm. online learning or, or residential, um, you know, on the ground learning. Um, I'm sure it's out there or I'm sure somebody's trying to do it. Um, I just, mm-hmm. you know, it hasn't hit my desk yet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, you know, sort of starting, you know, uh, investing in trust, investing in the relationship, and then uh, you didn't put it exactly this way, but sort of gently approaching the topic and just seeing what kind of response you get. I would imagine responses could be variable. Um, I-, I wonder if you might comment a little bit on some of the varied responses and your reactions to those responses in in terms of how do you, you know, how do you still uh, from, you know, kind of a leadership as influence, you know, kind of respond in order to still get to, you know, your desired endpoint, right? Uh, I just wonder if you might comment on that. Yeah, I think that's a challenge that every instructional designer has um, faced regardless of what your end goals are. I mean, you know, sometimes you get folks who aren't even that excited about 
doing the work in the first place. So the fact that they even have to meet with an instructional designer is, you know, met with resistance, let alone mm -hmm. whatever other goals you have for, for that interaction and that collaboration and whatever that end product is going to look like. So I think, you know, for me, and I, I have unfortunately met the, the spectrum in terms of people who are really excited and those who are a little less than enthusiastic. And I think it's really, you know, I always try to get back to the student angle. I mean, we work in higher ed to, and, you know, hopefully people are in teaching because they want to, you know, have their, you know, spread their ideas, spread their, their knowledge and help other people come into the profession or the field that, that they've been a part of. And you're kind of um, enculturating a new generation. You know, if you're in the sciences, you're bringing up a new generation of scientists. You're, um, you know, if spreading ideas around business uh, uh, concepts. If you're in a business school or in the arts, it's, you know, growing that, that, uh, that artistic vision in, in your learners. And so that's where I try to, hone in um, with any kind of resistance to any part of the, the instructional design process mm -hmm. is just, you know, thinking about, you know, I, I could, you could ask somebody and say like, what was your experience like when you were learning? You know, it hasn't, you know, everybody starts from somewhere and, you know, does it have to be as challenging as it was or can we make it mm. better in, in ways that, you know, you don't want to compromise your rigor, but, you know, what makes a course rigorous shouldn't be different based on, you know, what your what your learner's background and, and cultural experience has been. It should just be rigorous because the content is challenging. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I hear you centering around uh, uh, cultivating empathy uh, for the learner and connecting that to uh, one's own personal story and and kind of being facilitative in that way. Is that is that resonate? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's part of design processes, right, is like centering the, the user. And in, in our case, in higher education, those are our learners. They're, they're our, our end users. And bringing them to the forefront of that process and incorporating them in as many ways as we can. And, um, you know, we always... You, you try, ideally, you would love to have learners even in consultation in this process, but we know that our students are busy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. often not well positioned to be able to lend that time to, to processes like course design or curriculum um, you know, conversations. So um, just as an instructional designer, I think that's really one of the things that we bring to the conversation and collaboration is like that perspective of the student and having a deep understanding of, of mm -hmm. who they are and, and who your institution serves and, and who they want to serve and making sure that those goals are aligned and you know your design strategies that you're putting in your courses are actually matching up with the people who are taking those courses. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I might uh, ask you a double-barreled question. You know, they, they taught me in grad okay. school, never, never ask double-barreled double -barreled questions, but I'm gonna do one anyway. Um, so you could kind of, this way you can kind of respond in two parts maybe. You were talking earlier about um, hypothetical uh, instructor of record who says, okay, I'm glad that's over with. Well, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, you thought you were done. No, not done. Um, which, you know, we, we chuckle and because there's, there's iteration, right? I wondered uh, along this trajectory of um, aspirational goals related to equitable outcomes for learners, how, how do you personally and how do you encourage others to gauge progress, right? I mean, so much of change is iterative. How do you gauge progress and, 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 and see that you and your partnering instructor of record are making progress? And then how would you gauge whether you're sort of quote unquote successful or not, you know, longer term? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's definitely a conversation where you, it's hopefully part of the entire process. So, you know, Speaking from my experience of sometimes even just getting that course pilot out is difficult enough. Um, so starting from there, you know, you're, you want to talk about what does that success look like from the start? Um, and that's one of the things that I found through exploring this, this work and the scholarship that's already been done in this field is that um, changing the way that we think about success is a really key reframing mm -hmm. that that needs to happen. So, um, you know, whether that means like you're looking at what your current um, 
rates of passing are for different, um, you know, ethnic groups that are taking your classes and figuring out like, okay, well, maybe, maybe it's just maintaining whatever the gap is. We don't want the gap to get worse if there is a gap or, um, you know, thinking about different ways to, to collect that information. But like, what does that success look like in defining that from the, the outset? Because that'll help you set up the measures to figure out what that progress looks like. And it is gonna be different for every institution. We all serve different learners and um, even different um, degree programs. You know, you design differently for your for traditional four-year um, college bachelor's degree versus, you know, maybe an online non-residential program that you're, you know, you're attracting different students. And so those measures of success need to look different depending on, on who you're, who you're working for. Um, and so that's, again, like being really clear and explicit about who your course is for and who you're designing for, um, will hopefully help you kind of set those measures. But there, you know, there really isn't like a, a, a broad scale or something that's like generally applicable all the way across, you know, it's really about thinking about what makes sense at, in your institution and where you're working and who you're serving. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. That's, that's, uh, that's sensible. It seems like good advice. And um, as we begin to wrap up, speaking of advice, I wonder if I might um, sort of put you on the spot a little bit. Um, Tom and I have been uh, speaking uh, with each other and, and with, uh, with guests off and on for a while about just sort of the, the churn in our field a little bit and especially uh, the role of instructional designers in our higher ed context, online education. Uh, I just wonder if I could put you on the spot for e a piece of advice to the instructional designers listening to this at this, <laughs> at this moment in time and or the folks who hire and oversee, manage supervise instructional designers uh, as we're trying to just <laughs> keep moving forward in online higher education amidst the churn. I just wonder <laughs> if you have any words of wisdom. Oh, gosh, I mean, as somebody who was kind of part of that churn recently, I could say that um, having a good team culture is really important, I think. Um, it's really hard to leave people institutions mm -hmm. a little bit easier but it's harder to leave people yeah. um so making your your team a place where everybody feels heard their um their individual career aspirations are are respected and acknowledged and incorporated into the work as much as you can um and i think you know kind of keeping a pulse on on what's happening in you know higher education and online learning or on the ground if, if that's really more your your team's focus but keeping a pulse on what's going on you know regionally and and maybe nationally as well and just kind of letting your team know and you know new hires especially like how you're working to stay on top of that because that kind of to me at least signals that oh yeah this team thinks about the bigger picture. We're not just worried about, you know, what's happening here day to day, but we're listening and, and watching and, and paying attention to and competing with what's happening elsewhere. And, you know, that's going to help me as an individual contributor, keep my skills sharper. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's really, I hope that's good advice. <laughs> Those are my, my reflections as somebody who, like I said, participated in the churn <laughs> for a yeah. little bit there. Yeah. No, I, Sounds good. It sounds good to me. It sounds like good advice um, on 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 both sides, you know, for both both parties. So thanks uh, from me and from Tom, who will be wrapped around this conversation. <laughs> will be sort of a virtual party to it uh, later on for both of us. Thanks for joining us on Topcast. Been great having you here. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm really really happy for the opportunity. Thanks again. So, Calvin, that was your interview with Katrina Ware. It was. It was indeed. I was really glad to have Katrina join us, give her uh, front row seat perspective as a as a current ID, a lot more current ID than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we like to dabble still that's, on occasion. That's right. Mm -hmm. Some some wish that we wouldn't probably. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, in a very bougie way. Mm -hmm. You and I kind of still fancy ourselves instructional designers. Exactly. But no, it's good to to get her perspective. Um, it's an interesting organization if you're not familiar with WGU Labs, mm -hmm. and um, you know the whole idea of you know equity based design is is one that seems to be emerging 
in the in the space. Yeah. I see comments on it online, and um, and you know how do you how do you navigate that so that um, that you know you don't inadvertently address you know or, or create bias um, or make assumptions about an audience yet still be able to serve them in in the way that they need to be served, recognizing that you know kind of back to your before the interview mm-hmm. analogy of that that picture that we've mm-hmm. kind of all seen at the mm-hmm. baseball game, you know, recognize that then not everybody starts in the same place or needs the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, for, for me, I, I, I was put in mind, we were talking about this a little bit before we hit record, of some, uh, it's a different work, but some parallels to the work of our colleague Scott Freeman from the University of Washington, I think, uh, I think now retired in the last year or so, oh, actually. Really? Uh, yeah, but... Uh, uh, biology instructor, uh, now I think emeritus, and um, and researcher, and uh, we've had him on campus here before, and I recall him, I think we've got a recording of this, well, maybe we'll stick that in the show notes too, of him talking about, he was, he's was he been a big proponent of active learning in the STEM disciplines, the natural sciences specifically, and um, he was, I remember him talking about making a case to his colleagues about the value of active learning, and he did uh, a good data analysis um, looking at subpopulations of students across different demographics, and he could reveal uh, achievement gaps and uh, then revealed that if you employed active learning strategies, you close those achievement gaps. Um, And I think that's compelling. He talked about like folks who were like, I'm not going to do active learning, and they saw them, oh, Active learning has value. Right, right. It, it benefits specific students in, in key ways. So I think leading with, with data, I think, is a, is a good thing. And so we just need plenty of good examples of, of that and, and, you know, focus on the intended outcome, the grasping the apple or the peering over the fence right, or whatever, right. the, whatever yeah. the deal is. Yeah. Well, another thing she talked about that I thought was really interesting, too, was um, – you know, kind of just the role of the of the instructional designer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know it's something we've touched on in mm-hmm. episodes past, yep. but it's always a good reminder that the role of the instructional designer is yes, their expertise mm-hmm. in online course design or even any course design, mm-hmm. but it's a relationship yep. with the faculty member with whom they're working, and that that only works when that relationship is you know. Is, is two ways and is value added and that the that the instructional designer is kind of recognized for their expertise. Yeah, I mean, realizing, of course, as, uh, as we commented in the, the conversation with Katrina that, you know, there are variations in the role, you know, but yes, I, I think it, at its heart, there is some sort of a rapport and a relationship. Some, uh, some shops are more classic, you know, kind of, it, faculty member is SME and we'll build it for you, right. but but there's still got to be some trust and some some rapport. Uh, we're more consultative, and so you know the, the the hands of the faculty member are on the are on the tiller as it as it were. But yeah, I think your your points well well taken. Um, I, I wonder not to leave the the main topic too much, but I wonder what you thought of um, Katrina's comments about the. ID market churn, since that's been a little bit of a sub-theme for us. Yeah, well, it, it, we're not alone, right, in in noticing that mm-hmm. instructional designers are in high demand at mm-hmm. the moment, sort of coming out of the pandemic and mm-hmm. with all of these schools and even companies recognizing that, you know, online is, is critical and um, that, you know, just having subject matter expertise is not enough. <laughs> you need to know how to design something, right, so it's effective instructionally. And I, I was, uh, I was a little, I felt a little validated <laughs> by her comment about kind of creating a culture mm-hmm. where people want to be and work, and that there's kind of a unique value proposition in higher education that's a little different than if you went to work for some mm-hmm. pharmaceutical company or something, you know, d- doing instructional design for training. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that. I, I have a previous career doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something about higher ed, and, mm-hmm. and if you can create a culture which values people, where people feel like mm-hmm. they're a part of something really, really good, um, then, then that can make all the difference. Yeah, and I yeah I agree with that, and I think uh, you know sharpening that point further, even you know individuals feeling seen, feeling heard, um, and uh, and those in in positions of management and leadership uh, staying and and 
open and transparent dialogue that that that's a it's kind of a two-way street you know that yep. helps a lot yeah yep. i think yeah for sure yep. absolutely cool um well i don't know you want to try to put a bow on this and mm -hmm. land the plane to mm -hmm. add all of our metaphors in one mm -hmm. one little package put a bow on the parachute and uh, i'll see you on the ground uh sure how about this uh core to our work of online and digital learning is ensuring equitable access to education, broadly speaking. The more focused design work of instructors and instructional designers can increase the likelihood that all learners in each and every class specifically have the opportunity for equitable outcomes. How's that? Yeah, that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. why we're here. Cool. Um, you think you can indulge me a plug? I'm very indulgent, Tom. So let's let's uh, see if we can squeeze one in here. So just a quick reminder for all of our listeners that every episode of TopCast includes a page online containing mm -hmm. numerous read more about it resources related to the episode topic. Mm -hmm. This always includes a bio of our featured guests, sometimes pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes includes uh, little pop culture tidbits connected mm -hmm. to our mm -hmm. banter. Mm -hmm. Who knows what today's might yield? Yeah. And check it out. Mm -hmm. within your listening app or online at http colon slash slash topcast dot online dot ucf dot edu again topcast dot online dot ucf dot edu mm -hmm. cool well kelvin thank you for the rwandan coffee mm -hmm. thank you katrina for uh being on the podcast mm -hmm. and until next time for topcast i'm tom i'm kelvin see ya mm -hmm.